Sunday morning to thank God for the gift of life and the gift of each other, and I am grateful that you are here with us in worship together, whether you are here, here in person in the sanctuary, or here with us through the miles. We're grateful to be a community of faith that stretches across this country and across the world. I'm Pastor Jessica, and I'm one of the pastors on staff, and it's my joy and delight to welcome you to worship this morning, but I hope that you will take time to welcome and greet those around you. Um, after the service, during the passing of the peace. Today, we have a great opportunity to get to know each other and mix and mingle a little bit. After worship, we are gonna head outside, out back to this gorgeous lakeside, sunny afternoon, and have a little picnic. Um, there'll be a little refreshment to share. If you didn't bring a sandwich or something, there's a little extra to go around. So if nothing else, please stay just for a few minutes and reintroduce yourself to someone, find someone new and share your name and something about you. That's how we grow as a community of faith in relationship and friendship with each other. If you're new with us today, I'm so glad that you decided to come and make this your first day with us. It's not an easy thing to walk into a community of faith, so thank you for taking that risk today. I'd invite all of us, whether you're new or have been here for 60 years, to fill out one of the worship response cards that you can find in your bulletin or in the pews behind you or in front of you. These are ways that we can help get to know you as pastors and as staff in the church. There are ways we can learn how to pray for you and with you and for the people you love, or perhaps help you get connected in a way that would be helpful to you in your journey of faith. As we continue worship, I wanna draw your attention to just a couple of announcements. One is that if you have a kiddo in your life or you are a kiddo in our lives, we hope that you will come to our vacation Bible camp this summer. It's in early August. It's a lot of fun. Cindy's going to be helping to lead it, and it's a great way to meet other kids in the church, to grow, to play, to have a good time together, and we hope that you'll make this part of your summer plans. I also want to... Um, let you know if you didn't see the Wednesday email that Laura Maloney and Griff were engaged this weekend. So let's give them a hand and celebrate with them today. <laughs> we're really excited for them, excited for Angie and Alan who will be married later this year. It's a great time to lift each other up and to have the joy that they have. Let it be our joy too. So thank you. Thank you, Laura and Griff, um, for letting us share in your joy. I'd also ask that as you go about your day-to-day -day and the week ahead that you would join your prayers with mine, particularly for Martha Fallis, for Ben, and for Chris, who lost Richard on Friday. Um, they have been, you have been praying with them through a long journey of illness as Richard has struggled in mind and in body. And so we give thanks to God for the gift of resurrection. We give thanks to God for God's presence in their lives. And I give thanks to God for this community of faith and the way that we continue to show love and care for each other. So please hold Martha and Ben and Chris in your prayers today and in the days to come. Would you join us now for our call to worship? So many times when we gather with others, whether at worship or at work, whether at home or at a party, we want them to see our best selves. So many times when life takes a bad turn, we complain about how life is unfair or about how our friends have abandoned us. But we don't like to suffer. 
Endurance produces character. And hope does not disappoint. We have God's hope within us and around us, so believing that, let us worship our God together.
You may be seated. Our lives are indeed constantly confronted with pain and sorrow, and yet despite our thirst, we find ourselves ignoring the source of renewal and refreshment that a relationship with the Holy Comforter gives. So let us together come before God, confessing the reality of our lives, first individually in silence, and then together corporately. Paul wrote to the people of Rome about our struggle in relationship with God and with each other. He says, you know the story of how we landed in this dilemma we're in. First sin, then death. No one exempt from either sin or death. Sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. The Lord, we confess, we feel surrounded by troubles in our lives and our world. Yet we continue to shout our praise, even when we're hemmed in with troubles, because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us, and how that patience, in turn, forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. Lord, we confess we are weak and feel ill-equipped for relationship with you. Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself by this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. Lord, we confess we often fail to do embrace your gift of love. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. Sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he's already thrown open his doors to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. Grace invites us into life, a life that goes on and on, world without end. Friends, believe this good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Having received the grace that comes with forgiveness and the power that love brings, let us share that peace and grace and pass it along to one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's extend that peace to one another.
Good morning. God loves you. Oh my. Woo! I was very loud, which is kind of how I roll. God loves you. No matter what. Okay. Anybody feeling young at heart or kids, come on down and join us. We have a super fun Sunday that involves paper airplanes. I found this really amazing website that was so amazing I even joined and now it's calling me an official pilot of, <laughs> of paper airplanes. So this morning I created these. So what we're gonna do is I invited Jess, Pastor Jessica and Pastor Phil up here to throw some paper airplanes with me. Okay, so what we're going to do is each of us are going to throw them one at a time. And I encourage all of us just to notice. What do you notice about the way the paper airplane flies? Okay? We'll stand to throw just so we can be like really ready. Are we throwing at the same time or one at a time? No, let's go one at a time. We're going to try to go down the aisle. So, you know, protect yourselves in the middle. Um, I've never had any serious injuries yet from paper airplanes. I'll go first just as a, like a model for my... Okay practicing or my throwing technique oh Whoa. oh okay so there's mine my turn okay. sure oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> almost took out Lauren <laughs> okay. One more. okay Phil Whoa. oh wow that was pretty awesome thank you you guys okay what things did you thank you I'll hold on to that what thing we're gonna make these downstairs together today I promise what things did you guys notice about the paper airplanes? Yeah. They don't work exactly how you want them. Oh. <laughs> you guys are so wise. They didn't work exactly how I wanted them to. Very few things do for me. Um, what about you? Everyone's was different. Yes. Anything else? Yeah. The point maybe gives us an idea how far it will go. That's a great observation, Owen. So I think the paths that these planes took, this, this month in kids' ministry, we're talking about the word faith and what that means to us. And I think that the path that all of these planes took is similar to how I think of faith. Mine went pretty much straight down and ran into Joseph, or Joshua. Lauren, or Pastor Jessica has tried to take out Lauren. I'm not sure if there's hidden meeting behind all this or not. And Pastor Phil's just like, Phew. still, his actually went right down the aisle. So for me, faith is going to look different for all of us. I'm going to tell you what mine feels like, and then we'll talk about it more downstairs together. For me, all those experiences are how my faith life is. Sometimes it is smooth sailing, flying high, right where I want it to go. Frankly, that doesn't usually last long. But God is with me in that moment. Sometimes it crashes right away, kind of like what happened over here with mine. God is also with me in that moment. Sometimes it kind of goes one way and then veers off and takes out someone. Maybe that's when I'm not very nice to somebody, even though I wanted to be. God is with me in that moment too. So we're going to make some paper airplanes downstairs. But let's, um, I want us to think about God being our co-pilot. We're both sitting in the front of the plane together. You and God doing it together. Okay? It takes both of you. Yes. You know, I, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, they asked, aren't we supposed to be the co-pilot and God the pilot? <laughs> Someday I will not have my mask on and you will see my, like, my full grin. Um, you know what? I don't know. That's where I am currently in my faith is that I don't know. For me, I can't say that God's, God does everything. It just doesn't work that way for me. But it might for you, and that's okay. We don't have to think exactly the same. We just show up here on Sunday mornings to remind one another that God is in our lives and to try to open our hearts and minds for whatever comes and to, be, and to trust that God will walk with us. Okay, so I'd like us to do a movement prayer. Like, can we all stand up if you're able? Get your flying wings on. 
I'll do the speaking, you copy my movements, okay? Good and gracious God, thank you for flying with me. Sometimes we are soaring and can see the beauty everywhere. Soar around a little bit here. Sometimes we crash and everything seems impossible. Sometimes we're up and sometimes we're down. And sometimes we're flying in loops. <laughs> we know, let's repeat this part after me. We know you are always flying with us. Amen. All right, kids who are joining me downstairs, we're going to head back. You don't think I can fit in this plane? I don't know. Maybe I have a shrinking machine. This morning we continue our sermon series on the book of Romans, which was written by the Apostle Paul, an influencer for the ages. Last week, Carter Baldwin gave a great introduction to the book of Romans, and if you weren't here, you might check it out on YouTube, where you can find all of our services from week to week. But for now, in brief, what we call the book of Romans was originally a letter written from the Apostle Paul to Christ followers living in Rome a violent and divided city at the center of an empire. 
Paul wrote this letter from afar, and the letter was likely hand-delivered person to person and read by another Christ follower in a church community that was meeting in a house. So the letter of the Romans was very personal communication about the most important things of life. So today and in this series, we are going to hear these words from Scripture from the mouths of our friends who live far away and worship with us week in and week out from different places. And today's Scripture lesson, we'll hear from Jana, who lives in the Pacific Northwest. Good morning, CPC family. It's Jana Goesware from Portland, Oregon. This morning, I have the privilege of doing the scripture reading. I'll be reading from the book of Romans, chapter five, verses one through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, last weekend, I was in the Northwoods, perhaps with some of you who were traveling for the holiday weekend. I was with my family and friends, and we decided to drive to the Red Cliffs, to the Apostle Islands, to kayak the mysterious and wonderful sea caves. We drove past family picnics and bar parties, town streets lined with American flags. There would be a parade in the little town of Gordon. Chairs were set up one by one, red, white, and blue, and little teeny ones for children, too. Traffic slowed as the people of the city swelled into town. This town is a town about 100 or 645, and I would say that most were present and accounted for. There was a meat raffle, the scouts had a booth, the church hosted a bake sale. It all seemed very quaint and hometown and kind. Well, then, as our car rolled to a stop in front of the post office, Another booth caught our eye. This one had a display of assault weapons. Children approached the booth, and they were given something, little toys or candy, and they smiled with delight. Adults pointed to this one and that one. Six of them Velcroed one after the other like a seventh grade science poster board presentation. Black, camo, pink. Someone had thought about how to socialize children to be unafraid of approaching these killing machines. Someone had thought about how color can sell fearful adults identity and belonging at the expense, perhaps, of unnamed victims later. I don't feel safe here, I said. Well, that night around the campfire, I heard pop, 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 and I jumped. And I had to tell myself, that's fireworks. I dreamt of gunfire that night. I woke up in sweats. But the real nightmare was to come. Monday morning, what was to be Freedom Day? 
And yet there we were again, captive to the power of sin and death. On Tuesday, I'm sure some of us woke up and tried to get back to our freedom. But on Wednesday, we learned that the Highland Park shooter had come to Madison, driven in our streets with 60 rounds, now practiced at mass shooting and fully capable of destroying any of our lives, the lives of our families and children. The American horror story came to our hometown, friends. And here we sit on Sunday, on a beautiful Sunday morning, and yet we still sit in the shadow of sin and death. Some days it's awfully hard to understand how a loving God could let all these things happen. But then I suppose God could be sitting at the Trinitarian family dinner table asking the same. Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, how in the world can loving human beings let all this happen? The Apostle Paul had his ear to the ground and to the heavens for conversations like these. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Paul heard that the Christ followers in Rome were asking similarly hard questions, like, what difference does it make being a follower of Christ, if we still experience all the same violence and conflict that other people do, sometimes more because we follow Christ and the people around us don't, would it change anything if we just let all this go? Won't we sit in the shadow of sin and death anyway? Paul took a very unlikely approach to answering these questions. <laughs> Paul took a very unlikely approach to encouraging the people of Rome to persist in the, faith of, in the faith of Christ. Paul began his encouragement with a deep dive into sin, our favorite topic, I'm sure. And Paul doesn't sugarcoat the conversation. I thought that preachers in my hometown churches were big on sin, but Paul is way, way bigger. When I was growing up, I often heard preachers talk about sin as if they were Harold Hill in Meredith Wilson's The Music Man. You got trouble right here in River City. Trouble with a capital T, and that rhymes for P, and that stands for pool. As in the pool table at the local bar, in case you haven't seen it. According to Hill, there is a straight line from playing pool after school to dropping out and heavy drinking and certain death. And American Christianity has been saturated with an understanding of sin as a set of moral standards about which each individual has ultimate personal choice. It is, after all, very American to think of anything and everything as within an individual's control. We can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps join the band of 76 trombones, and be in right relationship with God. Or we can choose to play pool and gamble or drink or have non-procreative sex or whatever is on the sin list that month. And all of these things can separate us from God and disappoint our mothers or our fathers. This is one way of understanding sin. And there are times when Paul talks about individual behaviors as sin. Some of you know this all too well as your hometown preachers use these texts as weapons against you. And I'm so deeply sorry for that. I cannot defend everything that Paul wrote, particularly when it comes to the questions of gender and sexuality and slavery. Paul, like all of us, listened to God through the filter of his own experiences and wrote from the lens of his social location. And when we read his words of scripture, we have to do some work with God, the spiritual work of discernment, and hopes of understanding what was inspired by God as wisdom for the ages, 
and what God might have left as cautionary tale. But here are some, some things I think Paul got right. First, Paul understood sin as something much, much bigger than an individual behavior or something that you and I choose to do or to be. The Greek word for sin is harmatia, and it appears 81 times in the writings of Paul, 60 times in the book of Romans, and in chapters 5 through 8, of which we read a portion this morning, Paul uses it 42 times. If you were to go home and read the book of Romans from start to finish and then begin again, you'd have this bleak vision begin to appear that humanity and all the world lives under the thumb of sin. In Romans chapter 1, Paul speaks of a people as having been collectively handed over to a confusing array of things that lead to death, dishonorable passions, the whims of our minds, injustice, impurity, the neglect of the divine. The word Paul uses here is paradidomai, handing over, a verb that is often used in the context of war and the surrendering of prisoners and slaves. The person who might best be able to help us understand our condition right now might be Brittany Griner. We're held captive by a force of evil beyond our control, and the pain and the punishment we experience because of it is wildly beyond what we deserve. And then, when all we want to do is escape from this evil power's grasp, we find we're coerced into working for it somehow against our will. The power to which human beings have been handed over to Paul says, is sin. Paul views sin as a slave master whose only wage or payment for service is death. And the siren song of sin that sings to us is futility and despair. Paul goes on to say that this is true for people of all religions and no religion. Judeans had the law of Moses to guide them, but sin crept in and use that law to judge them and condemn them for falling short. People of Greek origin had the creation itself as a witness to the reality of God, and yet Paul says all people, all, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, have neglected the divine in their lives. And the longer you read through Romans, the more you begin to get this sense that sin is not just a thing humans do, that's morally incorrect. It's not something that only concerns Christians or governs our life with God here in religious settings. Sin is more like a cosmic terrorist who pops up in our cars, in our homes, in our schools, in our politics, even in our religious life, and brings chaos and conflict. Sin is a band leader that somehow has all of humanity in a seemingly inevitable death march. So like it or not, this gives us a framework to understand what happened this week and all our conflicting responses. There was yet another mass shooting in America and its executioner drove through our town. And we didn't want it to happen, and yet we're voters and taxpayers, and somehow, by participating in the system of the status quo of the society, we too are entangled in sin's snares, and an outsider looking in could well all hold us accountable for these murders too. The word Paul uses to explain it is sin. It's powerful. It leads to death and it's at odds with God. As I said at the start, it's an odd way to give a pep talk. But it's Paul's way of expanding our vision wide enough to evaluate, perhaps again, whether or not we think it makes any difference to remain a committed follower of Christ. It's pretty effective, actually. 
Because if sin isn't just a behavior we can avoid, if sin is an out-of-control cosmic terrorist, we might need more than our bootstraps to make it through. We might need what Paul describes in chapter 1 as the gospel. God's saving power for everyone who trusts it, for the Judean first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. The gospel is Christ's clarion call of hope, an emancipation proclamation that persons who languish in sin's grasp are now free. A response to sin that is big enough to be of some help. At the right time, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, Jesus died for the ungodly, for the weak, for the unrighteous, for all captive to sin, for those who have knowingly or unknowingly served the enemy of God. What does Paul mean? I think he means a lot of things. But one thing I think he means is that in Jesus... God showed us one human being who lived and died a free person. When a man spat on Jesus' face, Jesus didn't spit back. When another beat Jesus, he didn't hit back. When a soldier hung Jesus to a torture device, Jesus forgave him. And in doing so, through him and all of us, the key to unlock our chains too. Jesus was faithful to the God of life in a way that no one of us can be. And in Jesus dying, he showed us that there is at least one who is no longer captive to sin and the bonds of death. In his rising, Jesus showed us that there is at least one who is no longer captive to death. Jesus was the first prisoner whom God set free. But Paul says God's saving power is for everyone. In chapter 5, Paul writes, We have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, no longer condemned by death to sin, but lovingly rescued for a future with hope in which we will share the glory of God, life everlasting. When Jesus showed one human being mercy, Jesus showed us all God's disposition of love toward us all. God isn't satisfied leaving us captives to the power of sin. God sent Jesus to show us that God is actively at work to rescue, to redeem, to free, to push back sin's offensive, offensive so that we might live in freedom and hope. Freedom. Hope. These are the gifts of Christ's faith, so that we too might have faith. These gifts of God are meant to help keep us from drowning in the assumption that all of this might be just futile, that sin and death will win the day, tearing us from God and from each other. These gifts give us confidence that we don't have to serve sin and death. The Creator, the Lord of life, has made a peace treaty with us. Come, live in the light. Come, let me love you. Come, let Holy Spirit mold and change you. These gifts of freedom and hope, they make all the difference in our lives. Because no longer do we have to languish under the creed of despair, that all is going to hell in a handbasket. Because of what God did in the one Jesus, we can begin to imagine what God is doing in and with and through all. Governments don't have to be corrupt and ineffective. Governments could work for people. They could order public life with beauty and with wisdom. They could. Political leaders don't have to lead with the kind of power that threatens and intimidates the weak. They could be champions of the oppressed and teach the rest of us how to honor people who are different than we are. They could. Societies don't have to be unsafe for black, brown, queer, and trans people 
Communities could celebrate the dignity of each and create safeguards to ensure all our freedoms. We could. Parades don't have to include weapons of mass destruction, whether in the color guard, a sales booth, or in the hands of a violent teenager. Parades could just have balloons and cotton candy and streamers and, sure, trombones. They could. Saturday mornings don't have to be pulling weeds from the garden and bathing your dog when he rolls in the mud of the garden. Food could just grow and dogs could just stay clean. I don't know. <laughs> Governments could work, but puppy dogs will never stay clean. Is that too much to imagine? Friends, when things are at their worst, when violence and conflict cloud our days and it looks like sin and death have us firmly in their grasp, God invites us to remember Christ and trust that we too have been claimed, have been redeemed, have been liberated by the Lord of life. And we can let that truth wake us up and shake us up and stand us up, rise us up, back to embrace the gifts of life that are right in front of us. Gifts of grace, gifts of hope, gifts of freedom. Amen. This morning we have the privilege of seeing some of these gifts right in front of us. Of seeing how God's love shapes us and changes us. In recent months, this congregation has discerned a call to support families who are seeking to resettle in the Madison areas, people who have lived as refugees and who are seeking home. And over the past few weeks, we've been training with Jewish social services and Open Doors for Refugees. And Open Doors for Refugees has now been given the call to resettle a family of seven from Afghanistan. And we're going to learn from Open Doors as they do that, as we continue to pray for the family who will have a special relationship with this church. If you have joined these efforts in any way, prayed for them, signed up to join a team, taught us in some way, or if you'd like to join those efforts today or in the days ahead, I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit that we might pray over you and bless you and commission you for that work. So will you rise as you are able and called? This includes the doers and the prayers, friends. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, what a beautiful thing it is to behold people whom you love who now agree to be vessels of your love for others. We thank you that in a world of violence and chaos, you yet move and work, calling people to be channels of your peace and ambassadors of your hospitality. You have made your home among us and gifted these, your children, with hope and generosity and tangible skills of empathy. We have many gifts, words of care, prayers of the heart, hands to drive, strength to move mountains of furniture and food into a valley of plenty. Bless our efforts. Make them more than we could ask or imagine so that people who have experienced the world's worst might experience the very best of your abundant life. We thank you for Jewish social services, for open doors, for refugees, for the many in our own congregation who've gone first, who've gone ahead. We thank you for Mary and Angie, for Jean René, for Matt, Guy, and Amy. Refresh their spirits that they might continue to lead us with vision, skill, and compassion. We thank you that you be with families around our world who have left their homes under duress. In their weeping, be their comfort. In their waiting, be their companion. When the nightmares come, sing songs of beauty and whisper words of love. When the homesickness and despair threaten to overtake them, Make visions of hope dance before their eyes. 
And oh God, this very moment, we ask that you would be with the one family who will come to join us in Madison and have a special relationship with our church. We don't know their names or even where they are right now, but you do. Love them well, teach us to love them well, and help us to receive the love they will bring. Give them safe passage and unfurl before them a future here in which they can thrive and be the beautiful children of glory you've created them to be. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. As people who follow Christ, the people of this congregation are generous in so many ways. We've seen an example of that generosity before our eyes in these moments as people give of their time and their skill. We see the generosity of talent. We also take time to give of ourselves to help sustain the work of this congregation. If you are visiting with us for the first time today, let this service be a gift to you as we all work together to bring life to our congregation and our community.
Because the gracious and loving and redeeming God of all invites us to come to him with what's on our hearts and minds, let's spend a few minutes in prayer together. I'll offer some words I suspect we share, but I'll also pause several times so you can silently offer your own concerns to God. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this week with hearts broken by senseless violence, both very, very close to our home and in places far from Madison, but no less important to you. We are grieved by the acts of individuals, factions, and even whole governments intent on harm. We ask for your protection, for your healing, for your abounding mercy to be poured out on victims. Lord God, open our own eyes to our behaviors and habits that foster subtle violence in our lives. Lord, hear our individual silent prayers for shalom instead of violence. We also come to you exhausted with political divisions and discord. We pray for leaders with compassion and with courage and with a commitment to integrity. We pray for your spirit to bring peace and healing and good laws in our own country. And we pray for the many others caught in the struggles in their countries like Chad and Sri Lanka. We pray for fairness and justice and protection for all people, regardless of their gender or race or wealth or power. Increase our own awareness of economic injustice and increase our resolve to bring more justice wherever we can. Lord, hear our individual prayers for peace and justice. We pray for relief for those caught in excessive heat or drought or even rain resulting from climate change. Increase the commitment of corporate and government leaders to steward the environment of your world. Increase our own awareness of the ways we choose convenience over creation care. Grow our commitments to protect and care for and enjoy your earth. We pray for your healing and comfort of those sick or suffering or grieving. For Colin, Dean, Cindy, Olivia, George, Galen, Kathy, the Frickenbirds, the Follicists. We ask for patience and strength for those giving care to these and others. Lord, hear our silent prayers for the people that come to our mind. Father in heaven, we thank you for the many places we have the privilege to be involved in ministry. Grant to us joy and wisdom as we work with the Community Fridge, Urban Mosaic, Fairhaven, Mendota Schools, Lucas, GatherX, Refugee Housing, Immigrants, and the many other places we seek to serve your purposes in the world. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together and worship this day. We thank you for the warmth of this growing community Hear us now as we pray together the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who is in heaven, 
holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now you're invited to rise, whether in body or in spirit, to proclaim the joy that it is to worship together. among us. God has filled us with Holy Spirit and poured out God's love through us, freed and redeemed us. So go now in peace. Go now with hope. Go now for joy, to enjoy this beautiful day, to enjoy the gift of one another, the gift of God's love and beauty that showers and decorates our lives, trusting that God will make all things new. Go now in peace. 